Aloha, everyone. Welcome to another edition of Thinking Things Through, Thinking Critically in Critical Times. I'm your host, Michael Sukoff. Today we have with us for a second time, Michael J. Thompson, who's a professor of political theory at William Patterson University in Wayne, New Jersey. Uh, we're going to be discussing uh, what is critical theory, part two. As some of you may recall, if you were with us uh, in early May, we had Michael on at that time and uh, started a discussion about critical theory, what it is and why it matters. In the interest of full disclosure, again, Michael Thompson and I have known each other as professional colleagues for a number of years. And both of us currently are working on books in the general area of critical theory as we are going to discuss shortly. Welcome to the show again, Michael, welcome back. Thank you, Michael, thanks for having me back. Great. Now, uh, as I mentioned uh, last month, uh, you've written a lot in the area of critical social and political theory, which we'll get into in a moment. You've also written widely in the er related areas of critical reason, the politics of inequality, political judgment, and the decline of the individual in late capitalism. In addition, you're a practicing psychoanalyst. Again, is there anything you'd briefly like to add about your background and, and interests? Well, I think just uh, uh, that um, big part of my life is teaching and uh, engaging with students. And, and also, um, that's a real big part of the critical enterprise is, uh, I think, um, expanding critical citizenship and engagement. Certainly. And uh, some of us intellectual types might refer to that as critical pedagogy. Yes, that is true. <laughs> All right. Well, uh, before we, we dive in here, Michael Thompson, um, I want to uh, share something. Uh, in our last show, you and I were discussing uh, the Frankfurt School, which was the original group of critical theory that came out of Germany uh, in the uh, early 1920s into the uh, 30s and beyond. And we were discussing the issue of uh, nuclear weapons and the dangers of a nuclear war. And at that time, I said that I wasn't aware of any of the critical theorists of the Frankfurt School, the original members, and we mentioned some of those names, having ever uh, said a whole lot about the nuclear arms race or nuclear weapons. And I soon realized I was, I was mistaken. Uh, I just want to read a brief part from an introduction from a famous book by Herbert Marcuse, who was one of the original critical theorists. This book was written in 1964 and it was called One Dimensional Man. Uh, so let me just read uh, maybe the first uh, paragraph. Quote, does not the threat of an atomic catastrophe which could wipe out the human race also serve to protect the very forces which perpetuate this danger? The efforts to prevent such a catastrophe overshadow the search for its potential causes in contemporary industrial society. These causes remain unidentified, unexposed, unattacked by the public because they recede before the all too obvious threat from without, to the West from the East, to the East from the West. And of course, this is referring to the nuclear arms race and the Cold War that was taking place back at that time between the United States and what was then the Soviet Union, now Russia. So I just wanted to set the record straight as far as I was concerned, that Marcuse and um, as Michael Thompson has mentioned to me off air, um, uh, some of the other critical theorists have also addressed the issue of uh, the nuclear arms race and the dangers of a nuclear holocaust. Okay, well, um, I want to continue our discussion from last time. And um, uh, let's start out, Michael Thompson, if you don't mind. In, in our last uh, conversation, you were um, reviewing for us some of the main dimensions of, of the critical theory of the Frankfurt School. And one of those dimensions that you pointed to well, you pointed to the concept of, of critique and the uh, related concept of judgment. So maybe you can remind us what those two terms mean, how are they related? And then I wanna get into 
that that dimension of critical theory. Um, yeah, thank you, Michael, for reminding us about that. I think the 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 core idea to remember is that um, the word critique, which in English and German are actually the same word, critique and critique, and in French, um, all derive from the Greek, the ancient Greek word for judgment. To judge something is to know, is to be able to distinguish things uh, based on you know their values, whether they're good or whether they're bad, whether they're true or whether they're false. So uh, in a lot of ways, critique, critical theory was really concerned with the problem of restoring to everyday people the capacity to think through their world in a way that was critical. Because you have to remember, um, what they were witnessing was, and as early as the 1920s and 1930s, and it's much more the case today, what they were witnessing was the eclipse of the individual. They were witnessing technological, political, economic systems that were becoming so large, so alienating to each individual that individuals were losing the capacity, the ability to think independently. And you have to remember, this is the fundamental building block of what democratic civil society is, the ability for each individual to think through their world. So critique is really fundamentally about restoring the ability for people to think through the world that they live in, to say, this system is good or bad, this form of technology is good or bad, this law is good or bad. That's fundamentally, I think, what judgment and critique are. Thank you for that. It's a, a, a very, uh, a very coherent clarification. So what I want to um, engage with you about now is, um, well, let me just say this. Uh, I think there are two dimensions of critique, and uh, one has to do with um, evaluating uh, whatever it is we're looking at, whether it's uh, a congressional hearing or something that's going on in front of us, or uh, a, a newspaper article, or, or uh, something on YouTube, uh, evaluate in terms of its, its factuality, okay? Uh, I mean, cri criticism, as critique as criticism certainly involves uh, trying to assess the truth or falsity of whatever we're looking at. Would you agree with that? I think it's, uh, it's not just truth or falsity, but the yes. critical theorists saw was important was truth and falsity can become relativized. What, become, what is true in one context may be false in another context. I think what's really significant about the Frankfurt School idea of, criti of critique yes. is that it forced us to ask what kind of society yes. is making the thing that I'm thinking about either true or false. What kind of society am I living in? And so it's not about just evaluating that one article or the Absolutely. one hearing. It was about asking yourself, how does this fit into the overall system of the social world that I live in? And that is what's being lost. If, you get, if, if you're lost in the particulars of the news, you're failing to grasp that you're really living in these large scale systems that themselves may be false. And false in the sense that they are promoting a false form of life, a form of life that does not actually uh, enhance and develop us as individuals, as rationally thinking beings, as effectively feeling beings. So Absolutely. really when you ask about critique, it's really about asking what is the social system in which I live in? Is that a false world or is right. that a true world? And a true world is a world where each one of us are able to live in a kind of free way and to develop ourselves as free, self-reflecting individuals. Absolutely. And in that respect, the world we live in is a false world. Mm -hmm. It doesn't yeah, matter. Uh, no. So I, what I hear you really stressing about the critique or the, the uh, approach of critical theories is values are very much a part of evaluating anything that we're experiencing, uh, reading about, uh, watching, that uh, we cannot separate the facts 
quote unquote facts of what is happening with the the values we place on what we're looking at and how we how we judge whatever it is we're observing as as you said true or false or maybe uh you know good or bad or uh mm -hmm. promoting a more healthy fair fairer freer form of existence um and i and i i think i think it's really important to add to that is yeah. that that's a very important contribution of critical theory is to yes. make us think again about values and what we value and why we should value it in right. other words i right. could say to you that introducing a particular reform at in a, in a school system at a university say it'd be more efficient for students to be able to finish school earlier if they don't have to take literature or philosophy right. and that may be true but it's not true education if people go through school without being exposed to literature and philosophy and art so it's so it's a question of the values determining what uh, what we consider to be true right. and, and our society i think that's what's really important is the society that we live in now is increasingly becoming dominated by values that are really rooted in economic, in economic life, in other words, capital. It is rooted in efficiency, the production of surplus, and consumption. Those are the values that are slowly but gradually dominating all forms of other values. Values of equality, values of justice, values of individual development. These are values that are being eclipsed by values that are rooted in a techno-economic administrative world. Yeah. And, the, and the critical theorists of the Frankfurt School are really the first ones that really put this on the agenda for intellectuals, but also for common citizens. The idea is that we should really be thinking through our world about how the powerful are able to impose their values and make them our own. Now, what you just said is extremely provocative in the sense it's not provocative for someone like me and you who may obviously agree with what you just said. But um, let's bring this down to, you know, the street level, you know, the ordinary person, for example, uh, who, who may not agree with what you just said. Mm -hmm. uh, the proof, I believe, is always in the pudding. So. Uh, let me just put this example out here and, and see where we go with it. Um, uh, you know, the January 6th insurrection, we've been watching, many of us have been watching uh, these hearings on television, on C-SPAN, on uh, MSNBC, uh, these hearings that are dealing with what happened on January 6th. And by that, I'm referring to the, the events at the US Capitol in on january 6th of last year where a number of people quite a large crowd stormed the capitol building broke in and for a while it wasn't clear whether uh some of our our lawmakers who are, have been elected to serve us would would their lives would be in danger okay so um think thinking about that occurrence and thinking about these hearings um how would a critical theorist or someone who's using critique in the way that you've described look at what they're observing there let's say they're just sitting at home watching the hearings <clears throat> there's a lot of information coming towards them and there's a lot of uh judgment going on by the members of the committee uh, I'm assuming, you know, we're, I'm watching, we're watching it on C-SPAN where there's no, there are no pundits making comments, interpreting things for us. How, how, taking that example, how would you use a uh, critique uh, to uh, understand and evaluate what's, what, what we're watching? I mean, simply put, I mean, what we're watching is um in real time the destruction of american democratic life and de democratic institutions what mm -hmm. these hearings are showing is not simply yeah. that a group of people tried to raid the capitol what uh -huh. the what the hearings are demonstrating 
is a pattern of activity by the former president, Donald Trump, to try in some way to forestall um, the, uh, the legitimate transfer of power. So I think what a critical theorist should be, I mean, saying is, um, asking what are the dynamics in my society that leads almost half of the population to continue to follow uh-huh. a person, Donald Trump, or a, a party, the Republican right. Party, which are literally becoming authoritarian and neo-fascist. Right. I really believe that is the critical theory question. There, uh-huh. the the pattern of behavior and the activities that are occurring. I mean, in terms that are that are being mapped out by the committee, uh-huh. um, are remarkable and remarkable for their robustness. Um, people, I I mean, and what makes over half the population believe in the lies? Uh, There's something about, see, I think what's, what's crucial here is what we're, what we're really seeing is an exercise, an example in mass manipulation of consciousness. Mm -hmm. This is a fundamental idea of critical theory. You know, the critical Mm -hmm. theorists were really schooled in this because they, uh, they were living and they ran away from Hitler's Germany. And they saw the way that a small group of people were able to harness radio, mm-hmm. the film industry, uh, mass forms of media for the first time to, uh, to effectively mystify and, and uh, disinform a massively enlightened public, Germany. Right, right. And I think what we're seeing now is um, a, a rerun of these events. So right. in many ways, the January 6 hearings are remarkable, not for what they're showing us, they're remarkable for the fact that so few people are actually moved from their original beliefs, unlike Watergate in the 1970s. In other words, society has, has so hardened itself against critical reflection and judgment, that people are even, very few people are even persuaded from their original positions, whether they didn't like Trump or liked him, um, that public opinion is frozen. People will still, people are still supporting Trump-backed candidates. This is a very, very different um, political and cultural environment from what we saw in the United States even in the night, early 1970s with the Watergate hearing. So I right. think as a critical theorist, what it opens up is the question, what would drive a society which has a robust history of democratic institutions and culture to actually follow someone who would destroy those institutions? And I think that question is the question that is that itself is very polarizing. In, in American society, which leads us to the question of like, well, why would people follow someone who is clearly against the values of, of liberal democracy? So, you know, the January 6th hearings are remarkable to me because of how few people are actually being persuaded, how few people are actually changing their positions when it's being displayed to them that there are still openly anti-democratic forces in this country that, that have broken the law and are not being held accountable. Right, right. Remember, can I, let me just add something about this. Sure. Critical sure. theory is, a, is primarily, at the end of the day, about our consciousness. What okay. makes us aware when something is going wrong? What, make, what prevents us from becoming aware when there is injustice? When there, Wilhelm Reich, the famous psychoanalyst, said the real question is not why does the person steal, right? The question really is why don't they steal more often? Why don't they rebel against the system? The real question is why people support a system that is actually against their own interests and against their own common good. Destruction of the environment, economic inequality, exporting of jobs. Go, you can go up and down the list. Uh-huh. And why would people who are the most abused by the system support the elites that abuse them? That is a fundamental question for critical theory. And it's a question that's just as relevant now in, in the United States as it was 80 years ago when it was first posed. Right. Do you think uh, I will use the collective pronoun we, meaning anybody who's uh, thought about the questions you're raising now have 
have we started to understand uh, why uh, why that what you're describing is the case in our society today? I would suggest to you that um, since the era of what we call neoliberalism or the resurgent kind of marketization of society and commodification of the world, starting in the 1980s, moving forward, that you're witnessing an, an increase in mass anxiety in our culture. Individuals experiencing forms of insecurity economically, they're in terms of the family life, drug abuse uh, and drug use has gone up, alcoholism, uh, suicide. This is a sick society and it is made sick because uh, our, our, inst our economic institutions and economic life have undermined traditional forms of community, undermined uh, you know, secure forms of individual life. And I think what you're seeing is an increasing form of anxiety. And there's, there's a there are two ways you can respond to this. On the one hand, you can get aggressive and angry and move toward what you know, Eric Fromm called group narcissism, race, you know, racial identity, things like this. That's the that's the response of the right. That's the response of of, of the right wing. The other response is dissociation. I'm whatever the whatever culture of like whatever. I just want to you know do a joint and just zoom out, or I just can't deal with it, so I'm just not going to. Deal. And so you get this whole culture on the other side, which is dissociated from what's happening. So what I would suggest is the culture is becoming so precarious. People's lives, the inequality, the middle class is, is disintegrating, is almost crumbling to nothing. Uh, generation Gen Z, what we currently call Gen Z, looks to the future as if like climate change is going to destroy us. So I might as well not even have children. There's a sense where there's a sense where each one of us has our own forms of anxiety but that the anxiety itself creates different political responses. And I think that that makes you, when you experience anxiety, the first thing that goes is thought, reason, reflection, uh -huh. because you're in, a, you're in a state of panic. You're in a state of fear. Right. And I think what anxiety does is make you less reflective, less rational. And that's one of the reasons that our society is polarizing and becoming so dogmatic, left and right. Right, right. Uh we're, we're, we're more than halfway through the show, which uh, uh, I'm not surprised. Uh, but uh, I guess I want to raise a slightly different question, and, and uh, it may take us a little bit away from, from some of the things you just said. But um, uh, one, of, and, uh, you know, one of the concerns I have is when I watch hearings like this, um, it, of course, it, it's been very moving for me, especially when I when I watched the testimony of um, uh, Andrea Arche Moss and Ruby Freeman, her 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 mother, yeah. testify yeah. as to what the horrible things they've experienced just as, as a result of doing their jobs and counting ballots and so forth. I mean, that was extremely moving testimony yes. for me, and um, that kind of cuts cuts through a lot of the you know here's what happened and why and stuff it's like these people in trying to do what they thought was their responsibility or duty as citizens of this country were demonized attacked by the president of the united states their lives have been threatened uh so i guess where i'm going with this is so that we have that kind of uh uh experience of you know the um, an emotional dimension of what some people have experienced as a result of uh all the f events that led up to the january 6th insurrection and at the right. same time in the in the discourse in the discussion in the hearings there's often a reference often are references to you know democracy and this is a threat to democracy but what never often never gets uh, addressed is what are we talking about when we say democracy? Uh, so th this is a perhaps a related aspect of critical theory as critique and judgment is how, how do we, when we're presented with certain kinds of uh, values like democracy or freedom, yeah. uh, number one, how are those concepts presented to us in the context, let's say, of a committee hearing or a news show or a pundit uh, 
giving us their opinion about some something that's going on in the world. Well, the definition, the definition of the con yeah. of the word, right? This is a very important idea, um, yeah. and it's and I think first of all, let me just say, whatever democratic institutions we have are under threat at this time as yes. in no other time in American history. Yes. So whatever, however you construe democracy, the idea that there will be a rule of law with some representative government, those uh -huh. institutions are under threat. But right. let me just say, I agree with you. I think part of what imminent criticism is a technical term, but the idea of critique is, is to take a word and begin to open it up what you believe it means. Inquire, right. what does democracy uh -huh. mean? What does the right. word come from? What's its history? Do not uh -huh. accept from the outside world. Yes. what the definition of a word means or what the or don't assume you know what it means right. don't assume right. you know the words that the meaning of the words that you use because they haven't been interrogated you need right. to inquire right. reflect right. on what yeah. they mean that's the yeah. beginning of the openness of mind that's required and that's what critique is right opening up the things that we think we know to uh, what we may uh -huh. not know and the challenge is for any uh uh, citizen or uh, participant in in the culture and politics of the United States is learning how to do that. Well, you don't live in a culture where you're where you're taught to do it. You live in a culture Absolutely. where things are very top down. So the TV tells you what to think. The radio right. tells you. The internet tells you. What right. we need more is is our ways of learning that are dialogical, where people talk to one another, where people uh -huh. share in a safe way. This was right. the educational world that many of us came from before the internet. And that's the right. educational world that bore democracy, like in ancient mm -hmm. Greece. That's uh -huh. what you need. Absolutely. Humane, non-mediated through technology forms of discussion and thinking and inquiry, reflection yes. and yeah. question and answering. That so, Restoring that to the human experience will also restore critique and democracy. So uh, as our last uh, question, as we wrap up, how can we bring bring about those kinds of conditions? What would they look like? What would move what social would moves at the uh -huh. core of it all are social movements. Political yeah. life in the democratic world is brought to people saying we need something different. And what I'm suggesting yeah. is we think about what's different and as being more human, more engaged, and try to reproduce that in our everyday life. Right. Well, thank you so much, Michael Thompson. As as before. We've run out of time, but uh, you, and that's all the time we have for today. Uh, but I hope we'll have you back again. We've been speaking with Michael J. Thompson. Thank you. Yeah, great. Professor of Theory at William Patterson University in New Jersey. Thanks so much for joining us today again, Michael. Thanks, Michael. Great. Uh, this has been Thinking Things Through, Thinking Critically in Critical Times on Think Tech Hawaii. I'm your host, Michael Sukoff. Uh, please join us again two weeks from today at the same time, wherever you may be. And please do uh, communicate with me with your questions, comments about the show. Uh, if our engineer is able to, at this late time in the broadcast, to put my email address up on the screen, that would be great. Otherwise, it's Hawaii is calling, three words, H-A-W-A-I-I, -I, second word is, I-S, third word calling, Hawaii is calling at gmail.com. Please join us again two weeks from today, wherever you may be. Mahalo. Thank you. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.